I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. A couple of things before I, I move into uh, my talk. Um, the first is that if you would like to make an offering financially uh, in, through your generosity in support of uh, me and this gathering and this practice, I'm going to ask you, if you like, uh, I'm dedicating the Donna tonight, the offerings tonight, to the Global Compassion Coalition that I founded. And if you're moved to make a tax-deductible donation before year-end, to the Global Compassion Coalition, I would certainly welcome that and say from my heart that I think it is a worthy cause. And if you take a look at our website already, uh, wow, we've made a lot, a lot of progress just in the last six months or so. Uh, and we're just getting started. The basic idea is how do we form large coalitions of people and organizations that are big enough to actually tackle systemic sources of suffering? Uh, and if you look out at things like climate or the rise of authoritarianism or grinding poverty, the persistence of racism and sexism, you start to realize that the only way humanity can really uh, put a major change in those kind of issues is through coming together at scale. Many, many people coming together collectively to change systemic sources of suffering, moved by compassion. So anyway, the Global Compassion Coalition, I invite you to consider donating to it as your expression of generosity or gratitude toward uh, the teachings tonight. Second uh, <clears throat> thing I'd like to mention is about that meditation. In my own, I did the best I could with it, uh, way, I was drawing myself and all of us into one of the most fundamental central recognitions it's a it's an emotional recognition it's a somatic felt recognition in buddhism of the overwhelming unstoppability of change and as that recognition that the feeling of it the knowing of it directly as you just uh, uh, you know live in the middle of the changingness of everything it 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 helps us let go it helps us release clinging because we realize we're trying to cling to a frothy waterfall racing past us every instant as the next, you know, arising appears in reality. And that insight into changingness, into impermanence, that's a felt, felt kind of recognition, um, leads to a deepening uh, and far reaching equanimity. So if, you know, don't take my word for it, take the Buddha's word for it, that that is a profoundly useful practice to know and surrender to changingness in a way that helps us hold life more lightly. Okay. And then I would like to speak to a question and comment uh, and the person's name came in, um, let's see, it was from Gail Peterson at I think 38, where am I going? I have to roll up, sorry, I scrolled down. Bear with me, beg pardon. There we go, 6.07 p.m. And it's an important question that Gail is asking. So if you weren't here yet, um, I was responding to a question that was about uh, grief continuing to come for someone. And I said a variety of things. One of the things I certainly said was that grief comes in waves and there's a very natural process. And that grief for me is um, part of living. Um, somebody wrote, I read it recently, loving is losing. <laughs> There's an inherent losingness that we're exposed to in the golden wind of life if we love others. And Gail asked me, 
you know, what do, Rick, what would your reaction be to your own beloved wife dying today? Would you even know the first dart from the second one? Gail writes, I find your approach is only cerebral. And yet, thanks for your thoughts. So I want to speak to this. Um, what the Buddha taught, and certainly it's my experience, is that there are the first starts of life, inevitable pain. Then there are a whole bunch of reactions we add to what is primary. And there is great wisdom in Buddhist practice, and I think affirmed in other approaches to the mind, including from my own background in clinical psychology, that the closer you can come to the primary experience, to the extent that you resource yourself to bear it, to, to tolerate it, the, the closer you can come to the raw primary experience, the better, in terms of better, in the sense of being whole and connected with yourself in ways that are overwhelmingly not cerebral. Um, and in that connectedness with yourself, there is an intimacy with yourself, a lovingness and compassion toward yourself, and a flowingness with the primary experience. And in that flowingness with it, there is less and less suffering. There may still be the pain of grieving, but complications of suffering that we that get added to the raw primary experience of loss um, those are increasingly unnecessary right and the recognition of the difference between the first start and the second one is of course up to you uh, a lot of the characteristics of second dart reactions is a lot of self. In other words, there can be the raw primary experience of grief. You've lost someone. I've lost beings, not my wife, certainly, um, but I've lost beings and I, I grieve them. Um, primary experiences tend to be quite simple. They can be, they can be very intense, but they're, they're very direct or immediate. If on the other hand, if I were to start getting into a whole cascade of uh, what will happen to me and I should have done this and that differently and why didn't other people help me more or respect me more or listen to me more, you know, that's a second dart alert. <laughs> That's a yellow flag right there. You know, the yellow lights should be blinking on the inner dashboard when a lot of me, myself, and I gets caught up here. So the knowing of the difference, uh, being able to, in other words, we're speaking here about self-awareness, particularly awareness of what is not thought, what is not cerebral what is emotional, what is somatic, what is full of desire, you know, and the combinations of these. As we know these, as we become more and more aware of these in ourselves and our, we become more and more acute and granular in our self-awareness, that's an extremely embodied, way below the head kind of knowing. And, um, and then to finish in all that, um, there's nothing in what I'm talking about that's a turning away. People wrote me something about, you know, to contain it. I'm not talking about containing grief at all. I'm speaking of the opposite. I'm speaking of an undefended, uh, open, surrendered immersion. In what is what in what is primary and in that immersion in it paradoxically there is flow there is flow um, and if there isn't flow it's usually because we haven't gotten all the way down to what is barest most intense most vulnerable 
most difficult to feel. And yet that is the most important thing of all to feel and to resource ourselves to be able to feel it. Right? Um, and, and I just kind of nominate for your consideration um, that there is often a moment in the flow of our experience when something powerful has gripped us and is, is upsetting us and we've really, we've, we have genuinely practiced with it. Maybe it's something related to forgiveness, forgiving others or forgiving ourselves. Um, there comes a point, and you could apply this to grief as well, where something happens that, that reminds us or the grief comes up. I'll speak about grief here. And the real truth is, it, we feel it, it's there, and it's not so compelling. It's not so overwhelming. We don't, it's, it doesn't just pervade the mind, you know, and then, and then we just, we be with it. We write it out, we, we let it flow. It's more like at that moment, the grief has come up or the regret has come up or the, res, the, the rancor towards someone has come up. And at that point, we really do have an authentic choice. Do we turn toward it? and think more about it, open up, you know, go back into it again, feel it, do we feel it? Or authentically, there's a choice sometimes to say, you know, I have felt it, it doesn't feel good. And really, it's all right for me to shift my attention elsewhere. It's not that I'm thinking cerebrally about something, it's that I'm shifting attention to, to what else is true. And I'm giving myself permission to make that shift. Now you, you may not wanna make that shift yet, and it may not feel appropriate. It might feel like a dishonoring of the person you've lost to make that shift, to let yourself shift. I'm just naming the possibility of that step. And it's a step that has been very, very helpful for me to realize that there comes a time where, yes, I can, I can dwell on that loss at length, or I can feel the loss, I can know all that's true about it, including sometimes my own responsibility in creating that loss, and still give myself permission to turn a corner to live with that loss while living into the rest of my life. And that's what I'm just trying to name there. And like anything I say, find your own way with it. You know, see what matters to you. Uh, I'm describing a process that is, that is very felt, it's very embodied, which includes insight. If one might call insight cerebral, perhaps it is, I don't know. Um, there's no replacement for insight, just like there's no replacement for embodied, surrendered experiencing, you know, in the, in the path of healing and liberation. Uh, okay, so hopefully that was useful. Uh, I'd like to talk about letting go, right? You know, I think about sometimes I'll say stuff like, well, you need to let go. And then I imagine others understandably saying something like, well, thank you, Captain Obvious. How? How? Right? So that's, you know, and in fact, I really appreciated Gail's comment there. How do we recognize the difference between first darts and second darts? And, and how do we turn that corner if and when it, it feels like it's actually okay? And, it, and, and we're able to actually, in fact, turn the corner. Um, uh, so how to let go? I, of course, have a list right? What a surprise. So, <clears throat> <yeah>. <clears throat> oh dear, I got to turn on my recorder. Here we go. But happily, it was being recorded on Zoom. So now we're going to get a little higher quality recording from my stuff, my little tools here. So letting go, how do you let go? I invite you to reflect on some things that are there for 
for you to let go of, and I'm going to do this as a bit of an experiential exploration. Okay? So you may know that we've been exploring and talking about wise effort or right effort. You know, how do we make appropriate efforts in this life, in this life, including in a context in which we're living in the middle of the seething maelstrom, the seething turbulent changingness of everything continuously. Ah, right? How do we engage wise effort? So we've been exploring that. Last week I talked about uh, the teaching from T.S. Eliot. Teach us to care and not to care. Teach us to sit still. And how do we balance caring and not caring, especially in the wise, wholesome sense of not caring, by which I don't mean apathy or pushing away or neglect. I mean really a, a profound, um, imperturbable equanimity way down deep. Uh, alongside deep compassion and passion to help things be better. Right? Teach us to care and not to care. Teach us to sit still. Right? So in this wisdom of the wisdom aspect of not caring is a lot of letting go. And you probably know the Ajahn Chah quote, um, if you let go a little, you'll have a little peace. If you let go a lot, you'll have a lot of peace. If you let go completely, you'll be completely peaceful. So letting go is really valued. It's also really valued in my own overarching framework of the three types of ways to, to engage the mind, to practice. Let be, let go, let in. The second of these, of course, is about letting go. Letting go of tension in your body. Letting go of beliefs that are wrong or harmful. Letting go of feelings, emotions, letting things flow. Letting go of old habits, problematic desires. Letting go of tangles with other people. Uh, Self-doubt, self-criticism, old shoulds. Letting go of all of these. So it's good to let go. But how do you do it? How do you let go? Right? So let's talk about that. And I'm going to explore with you, uh, I think, five fundamental keys. Here we go to letting go. So first of all, really important, be okay with letting go. You know, um, I have a, <clears throat> a friend of mine. So this is a little off color. Be prepared here. So a friend of mine was joking with another friend. I listened to them talk. And my friend said to his friend, hey, man, I've had my head up my ass lately. And his friend replied without missing a beat, yeah, but it's great to be home again. So there's something about, and Freud talked about this as the repetition compulsion, that we, we want to not do certain things, and yet eh, <laughs> they're like a familiar blanket. It's really hard to separate from them, right? So we have to decide that it's okay to let go. Now, very broadly, it's paradoxically helpful to appreciate that whew, you're still here. There's an ongoingness of okayness as you let go. And that might seem really obvious. And yet in my experience clinically with a lot of people and more broadly too, um, that it, it can be weirdly um, scary to let go of familiar ways of being, to die a little bit to the old you to make room for the new you to start coming into being, or the new bits of you, if you will. Let those old bits go. We have to let those old bits go to make room for the new bits. Right? Um, there's still a kind of global continuity of personing, like a standing wave moving over a boulder, and yet the bits of water in that standing wave, they can be changing, right? Uh, so we're, we're helping some old bits that persist to release. We have to be willing to do that for the new ones to come in. So reminding yourself of the felt sense somatically of your ongoingness, ongoing all rightness can help you let go. You also have to decide to say, you know, I've had it with that particular belief or I've decided to um, step back from that criticism or I have this habit it's really hard to change, but I intend to change it. There's a place for that. Uh, just like there's no replacement for insight or embodied somatically centered experiencing, there's no replacement 
for exercising the will and the executive functions and deciding for ourselves in the innermost temple of your being, you know? I'm, I want to release that, okay? You want to get on the side of the letting go. If, you, if you've been struggling to let go of something, ask yourself, do you really, really, net, net, bottom line, intend to let it go? And maybe you're not ready to let it go. Or maybe, you know, the still the costs of letting go seem greater than the benefits. Or maybe it's not really a priority for you. And maybe it's not. Maybe there's a good reason to stick with it. It's up to you, really. But on the other hand, you know, if it's been difficult to let go of, you know, is it like, okay, let there be a knowing that sinks into you. Yeah, it's time. It's time to let it go, right? Uh, my wife and I recently cleared out a refrigerator and, you know, a lot of stuff in there was like, oh, oh. we been cleaning out a pantry in our garage too. Whoa, past its sell-by date. So you just, it's like you recognize things. It's time to let them go. Okay, that's the first, the first key to letting go. Be okay with letting go. You know, help the letting go to occur. All right. Second key, letting go in the body. Know what it feels like in the body to release, to let go. Exhaling is a fantastic opportunity for that. You know, you can feel the letting go in exhaling, right? You might also even right now, just practice, okay. Um, holding something, like the little eraser in my hand here, and then letting it go. See if you can find enjoyment in the physicalness of letting go. Are you okay with letting go? I think Suzuki Roshi said something like enlightenment is letting go of this moment while being lived by the next one. You know, can you enjoy the enlightenment in that kind of letting go? Letting go can feel very sensual. You know, there are obvious examples around uh, the bathroom, etc. but there's many, many places for letting go. Ah, letting go. Uh, there can be a softening, a melting in your body, right? And it's really helpful to appreciate in the face of often alarm that starts to come up. Oh, I'm getting too soft in the body. Oh, I'm letting go. I'm going to lower my guard and get zapped now. Keep noticing that you're going on being. You're basically all right. Keep turning toward reassurance as you let go in the body. Because we can have a lot of history especially if there's been trauma, that letting go in the body uh, can be very scary. Maybe we were punished in our history because we let go of something, maybe emotionally or perhaps physically. So now we're uh, holding on. So keep reminding yourself as you grow into this new depth of letting go in the body that you're still okay. Second. Third, letting go of resisting reality as it is. This might seem initially a little abstract. It's actually very, very, very fundamental. What is it like to accept things as they are? The feeling of this for me is a kind of undefended surrender in the body. They are what they are. Let Perhaps I don't like them. Perhaps I'm trying to change them. Perhaps I'm even outraged at the way they are. Maybe I'm grief stricken by the way they are. And there's the feeling in your body of surrender. Do you know what that feeling is? If you don't know what that feeling is, that's an opportunity to find that feeling of surrender. You don't fight it, 
you don't resist it, you give up. What's the feeling of giving up? To a particular thing. Well, knowing that um, giving up doesn't mean you approve of it. Giving up doesn't mean that you don't make efforts, perhaps with others, to change it. But it's a feeling of allowing. You may know the practice uh, developed by Michelle McDonald initially and then really turbocharged by Tara Brock with the acronym RAIN, R-A-I-N. And there are different words in English that are used for that acronym. Uh, you know, kind of in the background, R is for recognize. A is for accept or allow. I like the word allow. Galen Peterson, great scholar and teacher in Tibetan Buddhism at Naropa, uh, talks about welcoming, which is an even more forthright kind of allowing. We welcome, even if it's painful, we welcome the pain. Maybe we welcome the grief, we allow it. I for investigate or inquire, curiosity. And then N originally uh, was, trying, was meant not self. In other words, don't take it so personally, disidentify from it. Tara, I think really helpfully, has connected the don't take it so personally with N for nurture. Nurture ourself, nurture various conditions, maybe nurture other people as a whole practice, R-A-I-N. Well, the A in there is really central. Can't do the practice if we're resisting what is. So A for accepting, A for allowing. Know what that feels like. This is right at the heart of the teaching from T.S. Eliot, Teach Us to Care and Not to Care, where we both, where we allow things to be as they are, we, we give up. We let go of fighting with them while knowing at the same time that we can take strong action to change them. Right. It's useful here to drop beneath the words, not get into semantic tangles about, well, what do you mean, Rick? You don't have to fight with things with, as they are, but you can vigorously attempt to change them, right? Uh, it's, it, you, if you, feel your way into this, you can find that place inside where in the core of your being is acceptance of the way things are. You're, you're not in denial about them and you're not preoccupied with um, some kind of struggle with the reality of them. While at the same time, outwardly, you can be taking very skillful, vigorous action uh, to change things. Okay, so know what it's like to allow. That's a really central to letting go. Okay. Fourth, letting go of anxiety. Now we're getting very practical. So I invite you to be particularly mindful of the background trickle of uneasiness. Is there no anxiety whatsoever in your consciousness right now? For most people, the answer is, is no. In other words, there's, for most people, most of the time, a background sense of uneasiness, apprehensiveness, guardedness, defendedness, bracingness, you know, waiting for the next shoe to drop, scanning for the next threat. And that's natural. Uh, we have a lot of uh, birds and squirrels and bunnies and other creatures in our backyard on the edge of open space in Northern California. It's quite a treat to look through my window to the <laughs> to the zoo out there. It's an open air zoo, um, and lizards too. And they're all looking around. Mice, rats, they're all looking around. Fish. It's normal. And yet, we can also understand. That most of the time it's unnecessary. It's um, it's added. It's second art, in effect. It's added to an appropriate, uh, proportionate response to a genuine threat or or actual pain. All right. 
And so it's really helpful to become aware of a background quality of anxiety, apprehensiveness, uneasiness, including maybe in certain settings, like with certain people. It's feeling unsettled. We can't change it if we're not aware of it, All right? And so it's really helpful to be aware of that subtle uneasiness, that like contraction in the body, even around certain people. And then in your mindfulness of it, see if you can soften around it and release it. One of the, for me, really hugely useful and interesting practices over the last several years has been to explore what is it like to feel soft and undefended and open while also feeling strong and determined, right? So point is, we can relax, um, you know, unnecessary anxiety, unnecessary apprehensiveness, unnecessary uneasiness, while still feeling uh, very strong, very alert, very present. So remind yourself that you don't have to be chronically anxious to cope with life. <laughs> For many people, that's a new idea, you know? Um, you can deal with things if they come. You know, why be uneasy and apprehensive most of the time to deal with things that occur only very occasionally and which could have been dealt with it, when they arise without being um, primed already with uneasiness and anxiety. So see if you can be aware of this in your body right now. Can you let your body completely let go of guarding or bracing? Can you let go of your guard? Can you lower your guard? Now, if you have a trauma history. Obviously, this is a big deal. It really helps to look around, to remind yourself where you are in this place, and to experiment with lowering your guard like 1% at a time and noticing you're still okay, and then lower it 1% more. Still okay, again and again and again, for your own sake. So you're not so contracted and constricted by inside all that armor. All right. Letting your body relax, lowering your guard, and noticing that you keep being okay. This is a really useful practice if you have any issues with anxiety. Keep turning toward realistic reassurance and away from false alarmism. Decide that you want to believe in rational, realistic reassurance and enjoy the emotions and the body sensations that come when you let that reassurance sink in. Reassurance. If you're chronically anxious or dealing with it, reassurance is like your super medicine. Rational, realistic reassurance. And which has to include uh, knowing that you have limited control over the future. But when reassurance feels authentic and you can turn toward it and let it in, let it sink in. Reassurance is fantastic. What does reassurance feel like? Every if you think about little mice, little little kids, we you know we desperately need reassurance. Like we've made it to safety, we touch the tree, all the all the auction, free free free, home base now, right? Uh, your kids are okay. You're worried, and you let the reassurance land. Oof, reassurance really really important. Okay. Also in this allowing is recognizing there's so much about reality we cannot control. Are we willing to allow the winds to come, the maelstrom to come? Are we willing to allow the next moment to be whatever it is, including potentially disastrously? Because that's part of life. We live exposed to the, all the winds 
in this life? Can we allow that? You know, so much anxiety is about bracing against the next bad thing that might happen. This is where allowing comes in. That's why I talked about it before this. Can we allow that to be possible? We're going to take steps to reduce the likelihood of the neck of the horrible thing happening. But ultimately, we take the steps we can and the rest of it is out beyond our control. Can you give up about the bad things that are beyond your control? Wow. The truth is they're beyond your control, so you might as well give up anxiety. <laughs> it's like, you know, the logic of that I get is abstract, but if you can turn toward <clears throat> a kind of peace or even joy in giving up, trying to stop the horrible things that you can't control. Wow. Doesn't mean you're immoral. You're doing everything you can to prevent them. But the ones that remain that we fear to actually give up about. And then in the giving up of that, anxiety quickly fades. You know, you get on the airplane, you can't control whether it crashes. You're all anxious about the flight. If you just give up, yeah, I may die. I, I don't mean to say that trivially, but you know, you, you give up. Now, maybe that's out of reach for you, but I want to name it as an ultimate way to let go of anxiety. Right. Now, a couple more things about anxiety. Um, the great medicine for anxiety in our biology is feeling connected with others. You know, love flowing in, love flowing out, friendliness, respect, inclusion, um, coming from us, not just what we receive from others, coming from us. And so as we drop into the heart, you'll probably notice that your anxiety really reduces there can be that sense of open-heartedness. And with it, that open-heartedness, you know, can we find also a sense of strength? One of the most powerful ways to deal with anxiety is to access the felt sense in the body, the felt sense of determination, the felt sense of endurance. It may not be at all dramatic, but simply enduring, you know, uh, coping. The felt sense of yourself as someone who copes, knowing you're coping, being reassured by your own history of resourcefulness and resilience and coping in the ways that that's been true, right? So then you can find and center in, which is a great medicine for anxiety, find and center in uh, a sense of calm, open-hearted, strength. Those three together, calm, open-hearted, strong, really, really useful. Really useful for letting go of anxiety. We release anxiety and we replace it with calm, open-hearted strength. What's it like to feel calm? What's it like to feel open-hearted, warm-hearted? And what's it like to feel strong? And then last, letting go of tangles with others. That's a big one, right? So I, I'm going to do a little practice with you for about three minutes if you want to try it. Bring to mind someone that you're tangled up with, maybe with conflicts or resentments or maybe concern about them, helpless concern. Um, okay. And knowing, remembering the knowing that we can have concerns about other people, we can care about people, we can have regrets, we can discern the mistakes of others, 
while also not getting upset about these things. It's possible. We can disentangle from our upsets, our reactivity, and our craving, knowing that this is true. We can see clearly without getting twisted up, knotted up with suffering. So imagine this tangle with that other person in this little practice here. Recognize the knottedness of it, the sense of being bound or pressured or trapped. Be aware of, feel the suffering in that knottedness. You could also be aware of the sense of self, of me, my positions, my rightness, getting caught up in, you know, having your own way. See the cost of that. And now imagine that this knottedness, this tangle, is increasingly distant from you, separate from you. It's apart from you. It's over there. You might name it like, oh, that knottedness. And see if you can get start to feel a letting go of it. Maybe with a sense of, well, I've got things to do with this person, but I don't have to be so tangled up here. I can let it go. It could be a letting go in your body. A letting go of anxieties about this relationship or situation. Also accepting and allowing, accepting others as they are. While, you know, knowing you can assert yourself and have boundaries, there's that fundamental sense of acceptance of them as they are that can be like a solvent to dissolve the knottedness of, you know, certain patterns with others. Softening the sense of self about it all. Things unfold based on 10,000 causes and conditions. There doesn't have to be a me in charge of it all. Letting it go. Okay. Now, to be clear, that little practice there of letting go of a knottedness might have been, you know, too quick or too small for you. It's okay. But it might be a taste of how to relate to certain particular situations with a frame of letting go. Reminding you of what I said earlier about wanting to let go, deciding to let go, you know, including knotted tangles with other people. Okay. So this is a lot of the how of letting go. There's more to it, and there are certain kinds of letting go that are central to deep Buddhist practice in which we let go of um, the present continuously as the next moment arises, very deep forms of letting go and letting go in a profound and irrevocable way um, of the uh, belief in a separate self, Um, you know, letting go of um, the division between self and world in a fundamental way. There's some deep letting goes that we haven't gotten to, but these here that we explored, I think were quite, um, quite useful 
quite reasonable here. As we finish, I want to remind you that if you would like to offer a donation um, as an expression of gratitude to me and to this teaching stream, um, I dedicate the Donna tonight, the donations tonight, to the Global Compassion Coalition. I'm putting a link there into the chat if you care to um, you know, make an offering here. Uh, we've come to our time, but you know, I'm gonna go with you, Brenda. Okay, Dr. Brenda, ask you to unmute. We'll talk a little bit longer and then we'll come to a formal end, okay? So I'm good. Hi, Brenda, good to see you. Good to see you, doctor. Yes, and um, just to say at this late stage in my long life, <laughs> that uh, what I find with all of this wonderful last section on letting go, tonight's topic, mm that it's never really over, not hmm. all over. It's that you learn to see it and then let go again, and then it comes up again, and you let go again and again and again. So I just hope I'm not misinterpreting, but I never see it as so finite that it's done. Hmm. That's interesting. Can I speak to that? Um... Uh, I hear you, and I think people have different experiences, and they're legitimate. They're valid in their own right. Great. Um, <clears throat> the Buddha really focused on letting go that was, as he put it, without remainder. Remainderless. And so as an ultimate. Now, maybe that we think of that as almost like an asymptote. We approach it, we get closer and closer, but not, you know, but... He asserted and he demonstrated, and I think and some people have, where there can be a complete release. Uh, and I think there, there, so there can be, I think, certain things, I think of them as like trick knees in our psychology that we just acquired. There's, we're not, we're not, we will not ever not have been injured in that way. And so in certain situations, you know, that first dart will get re-triggered. I think that's really true. But I, my experience are certain things where there's an irrevocable, remainderless letting go. Where I, I've known people with addictions where they just stopped wanting a cigarette. They just, yeah, yeah. Or they just literally no longer had that kind of automatic reaction to another person doing a certain thing. They, it, was, it was released, you know. So I, I just think maybe some things are possible or some things, you're right, it's an ongoing process and there it is. Other things, it's gone. And it's because it's so gone, we don't even realize it's gone because it doesn't come back to remind us that it's gone. You know, it's just, I don't know, what do you think about all that? Uh, I could see it in terms of addiction and that wasn't necessarily where I was going with it. Yeah kinds of the way you've taught in earlier and you know and i've been seeing you and meeting you for years now uh certain ways in which you talk about we learn to deal with our anxieties or so it's yeah. not that they ever go they come yeah. and then you learn to deal with it and then it's up again and you deal with it or certain people who yeah. are close to you like my daughter yeah. and it is she's going to be who she is yeah, yeah. She's I agree with all that. And right, I, yeah. And that, I don't know how I could, yeah. yeah it would and be, then I have to keep, it's, it's you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not going to change her. I'm 81 and she's 50. Yeah. You know? And, you know, it's not going to change that much for us to ever be like that again, you know. Oh, so gotcha. Sure. Okay. All right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, um, if, you know, it's this classic combination, right, of um, you know, there are two that we we be with what's true and we work with what's true. Yeah, yeah, inside ourselves and outside ourselves, and being with is a primary matter. Where we feel the feelings, we accept and allow, it's the primary matter, but it's not the only matter. And so as as I talk about ways to work with the mind, including the deliberate working with that is letting go, deliberate letting go, 
You know, that is alongside the necessity to be with what's true. Um, and also, um, including things like depression. Someone asked me about depression in the chat. You know, I think of depressed mood or, you know, almost like a biologically based anxiety. For some people, it's a biologically rooted irritability, right? It's just, it's there. It's like having tinnitus. It's just there. And I am I get it. It's a first start that's just there. You know, there could be, like, I think grief sometimes settles into the background of awareness as um, it's, it's always there. It's, it's always there. It can be. Like, you know, certain moods can always be there. And I'm not saying anything to the, to the point of trying to resist it or suppress it. Yeah, it's there. And then the question is, oh, how do we want to practice with it? I look to that from yours years ago where you, you talked about, and you have in, in subsequent yeah. things also where you talk about uh, the mind, uh, the, 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 the green zone or the mind yeah. and the other thoughts come through and then go. So that's what I mean. It, they come back that way and then that you have to constantly uh, mm -hmm. uh, what do you call it? Negotiate, negotiate. So that kind of thing of going back to the, yeah, I got yeah. it. Yeah. Well, that's great. Yeah. And then there are these ultimate forms where, um, that again, I, I, per, I think they're true where you're so in the present with your own consciousness that as things arise, there's a, there's a there's an absolute acceptance of whatever's arising as it disappears and is replaced by the next thing. So in that sense, there is an endless dissolving, like the, the, the depressed mood or the sorrow, let's say the grief, arises, but in the moment of its arising, it is self-liberated. You know, it just... Because you're so close to the emergent edge of now, and there's and you're so not holding on to anything that things just simply. Whoosh, whoosh. I believe that's available. I've experienced that, you know, and I think that people who are deeply, you know, far along, they're kind of in the middle of that. It's just like there's like no attachment to anything, you know. Anyway, so. In that sense, they're not stuck with anything. It's it's there as it disappears, and then the next thing. This all might seem too abstract, but I just want to say that it's possible. Right, and I don't want to yeah. go on. I know it's the yeah. end, but I appreciate your your taking this time. Oh, for sure. Conversations are so rich. I mean, it could you know yeah. we could do a whole session with everybody talking That's right. about this. Thank yeah. you so much. As always. Oh no, thank you. As always, oh, I appreciate you, Brenda.